Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. It's time once again for your weekly wrap up. And a few weeks ago, I told you that I was pursuing my amateur radio license. And I am happy to say that over the weekend, I passed my ham test. As my soon to be fellow hams say, this is called punching your ticket. And I got my ticket and now I'm just waiting for my license to show up on the FCC database. And what I thought I would do today is talk about the test and what it involves, what I can do now that I have passed the test, and also some things that I learned about amateur radio along the way. Let's get to it. So what is on the ham radio licensing test? Well, it depends on what level of license you are looking to get. I was after the entry level one, the technician license. Everybody has to start there. And then eventually I'm going to go for my general and my amateur, but I wanted to kind of focus on the topics that would be on the technician license first. There are 35 questions on the exam for the technician class. You need to get 26 of those questions correct in order to pass. So you have to have a 74% or greater. I was able to get through with only two incorrect answers, so I did okay on the test. And there's a lot of different topics that are covered, which is good because if you're weak in a few areas like I am, the other areas will make up for it. Uh, there are some great resources for studying, some free, some paid. I went with a paid one, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the National Association for Amateur Radio uh, kind of puts together the exams on behalf of the FCC and they maintain the question pool. So you can go to their website and just get all the questions that will be on the exam. And if you're really good at rote memorization, uh, spend a couple weeks with some of the resources there and you will be fine. Uh, the test is all multiple choice. These are some of the things that were asked on the exam that I took. And this is kind of what you'll be getting into. Now, one resource, as I mentioned, that I came across was called Ham Test Online. I want to thank a viewer, Trent Curtis, who's been uh, giving me a lot of great tips along the way here. And what I liked about their approach is that it kind of works as a flashcard based thing, but they also teach you about what you're memorizing, which did help a bit. So for example, each topic has a little bit of an explainer and they only give you enough to pass that level of the exam. They don't give you more that might confuse you. Uh, so I found this to be a really good resource for learning all the basics of the test and the things that you're weak on as you come back to the website they keep putting those things back in front of you to kind of drill it through your thick skull uh, so i found that to be a tremendously good resource and once you get through the whole studying component it'll generate practice exams based on the probability of certain questions appearing and as i started running through those practice practice exams for a couple of days i was consistently getting close to the score that i got in person and i felt confident enough to book my appointment and go in and take the test uh, many of the uh, test sites that you'll encounter through the arrl website don't even require an appointment but i did check in just to make sure they were doing it and i drove out to a little fire station in wallingford connecticut where this radio club that administers the exams meets took my test took about 30 minutes or so, and I walked away with my ticket before it was 10 a.m. Now, communicating over amateur radio is very different versus how you communicate over the internet. A lot of things that we take for granted on the internet are not allowed over amateur radio and never have been. So let's take a look at some of the big differences. The first one is that there is no anonymity on amateur radio. You have to get a license, as I mentioned, and those licenses are public documents. In fact, if you go to websites like radioreference.com and look up a zip code, you can get a list of all of the amateur radio operators that live in that zip code who have licenses from the FCC. Every time you communicate over an amateur radio band, you need to say your call sign so that people can identify you and look you up. And there's a lot of different ways in which you can do that. What's funny though, is that as I was searching around my area for local ham operators, I discovered two good friends of mine have been ham operators for years and I never knew about it. So we've been having some fun conversations and once my license comes through, hopefully later today, I've got a friend I will be uh, texting first to get him on the radio so we can uh, have my first contact with this radio that I bought, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. The next big difference is that encryption is not allowed. Now this encryption rule applies to voice, to Morse code, but also to data communications. Now in the case of data, you can encode your data in a certain way with a protocol, but the contents of that message 
have to be in the clear. So if somebody is listening and decodes it, they can see the contents of the message. The one exception to the encryption rule is that you can communicate to an orbiting satellite encrypted in the case of trying to send it commands. But beyond that, there is no encryption allowed on amateur radio. The next one here is one that applies also to broadcasters, which is that you cannot use obscene language that is prohibited at any time. Now, this next one might surprise some people in that you are prohibited from broadcasting. And by broadcasting, I mean you cannot do a show like you're watching right now, where you're trying to communicate with a large number of people, sharing your opinions or doing a newscast or something like that. All of the communication happening on amateur radio needs to be between you and other amateur radio operators. You can, of course, ask for a radio check and do some testing or whatever to uh, just see if your radio is functional, but generally it's about a one-to-one -one communication between two people. And there are some exceptions to this, so if there is an emergency situation going on in your community, let's say a hurricane came through, uh, you can, of course, use the amateur radio bands for communicating general information about health and safety, but as a course of regular business here, I could not do the weekly wrap-up show over amateur radio. That is a prohibited activity. And there are also limits to what you can do on the radio bands based on the license that you hold, but there's also limitations based on the types of activities that you can do across some of these bands. And the ARRL has a very helpful guide here for what you can do on each of the areas that the FCC is allocated for amateur activity. And you'll notice here that as a technician, I'm limited to mostly what is in the right-hand column there. So for the most part, I'm going to be communicating locally, but there is one small area of the high-frequency band at 10 meters that I can operate in uh, with data only and a little bit that I can do with voice. But to really get long distance communication going, I'll have to get my next license to be able to access the bands that I'm currently restricted from operating on. But for the starting point here, I'm pretty excited. I got this radio. This is an AnyTone that uh, Trent recommended I pick up and I've been playing around just getting it programmed. So right now I cannot actually broadcast with this because I don't have my license yet. Even though I passed the test, it has to show up in the FCC database first. So I can listen to whatever I want here. I have uh, a bunch of local repeaters programmed in here and this radio is not all that powerful. It can do about six or seven watts of, of output power, but I can hit a repeater not far from me and that will allow me to go further because it's going to hit that repeater and then get broadcast back out again. And what I did here is I set up a, a scan of all of the local repeaters that I can pick up and it's picking up a whole bunch of stuff. A lot of hams talking to each other. Uh, one of the repeaters locally has an automated thing that goes off every once in a while, so I know I'm tuned into the right channel. And once I get my license, I'll start uh, hitting the repeater that is on the high school not too far from me and see who I can pick up along with uh, my friends that are also ham operators. So this is a good starting point. What I like about it is that it covers uh, the bands that I will most likely be using initially. It doesn't do the high frequency band, so I am going to be looking for a good starter radio that is designed for the desk, but this one will do digital modes, so I can talk digitally or I can talk in analog. It has an audio input here, so I can plug my computer into it. It also supports APRS, which is a packet radio mode that can transmit uh, its location as I drive around. So there's a lot of fun things that I can do with this. A lot of the things that I wanted to do with amateur radio, this radio can do, and it wasn't all that expensive. And I picked up the radio on Amazon. It was about 300 bucks. It definitely has a learning curve to it, but it hasn't been too bad to figure it out so far. The digital modes get a little more complicated because you have to dial in a few more additional settings based on the repeater that you're connecting to. And once I get all that stuff worked out, I should be able to transmit pretty easily. But I am picking up uh, most of the digital repeaters near me. Uh, this will work on the two meter and 70 centimeter bands, so definitely designed more for local repeaters and local communications, but that's a big part of what I want to do. And that brings us to the now what. Well, the now what in the short term is just connecting with some of my local uh, fellow ham operators, but also I really want to get into doing a lot of this digital stuff that I talked about previously. 
and because this radio has an audio input, I can connect it to the computer and send out packet radio transmissions. I need to figure out how to have the computer trigger the push to talk button on here to transmit uh, those data signals out. So there's a lot of stuff that I just want to do with digital uh, things on this radio initially, and then I'll uh, look at getting the uh, HF radio for a more permanent location, along with getting antennas installed and all that other kind of stuff too. Uh, there is a local ham club that I'm going to connect with, so I'm going to rely on some expertise from people that have been doing this longer. The last thing I want to do is get an antenna set up in my house that's a lightning rod, so I need to learn a little bit about doing the antenna placements correctly. So in the short term, I'll be handheld, uh, but eventually we will go beyond that. And I can also plug an external antenna into this just by screwing off the uh, built-in one here. But I got to go in to start with here. I'm looking forward to playing around on the air and I will share with you my call sign once I have it. So there will be more on this topic as we go on. As many of you know, this is a general tech channel. So I cover all sorts of technology and this is a technology we haven't talked about before. And I'm really excited to learn more about it and share what I'm learning with all of you as time goes on. As it turns out, the headquarters of the ARRL is located right here in Connecticut, not far from me. Uh, so we'll take a field trip one day and go visit them and see what they've got up there for radio equipment. I'm sure it will be well beyond my little handheld here and I'm eager to connect up with those folks as well. Now this week's wrap up is being brought to you by all of you. I wanna thank a new supporter, Brian Lawson, who contributed via our donor box page. We also have some folks who contributed via Super Chat and now Super Thanks, which is a new feature that YouTube just activated for me. You'll see a little heart below the video and you can make a little tip jar kind of contribution if a video helped you out. So I wanna thank Tech Time with Eric, Keith Robinson, Glenn Bracegirdle, Alex Smith, Zam, and David Lum for their contributions this week. I wanna thank everyone for their ongoing contributions and all of you who watch on a regular basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. Now, if you wanna support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. You can also support us via the YouTube membership program with that join button down below, along with Floatplane, which is the Linus Tech Tips video platform. And we also support Patreon. There are other channels you can find me on, including my Amazon page that you can find at lon.tv slash Amazon shop. Most of my review videos end up there completely ad free. We now have two email lists you can connect with the channel on. One, the lon.tv slash email list is a weekly summary of the videos that I uploaded. And then we have a daily digest, which is just the content of my blog as I post throughout the day. I've got a lot of cool links, different things that I encounter uh, throughout my journey online. And of course, we'll have more on radio there as well. So if you wanna get a little note in your inbox every morning from me, sign up, it is free. Uh, we also have the Facebook group, the Discord, and the Telegram channel if you want to connect with me and other viewers of the show. I also have a store where I sell previously reviewed items at prices less than what they cost new. And you can find that at lon.tv slash store. And we have a separate email alert for the store whenever I add something new to it, which you can find at lon.tv slash store alert. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. I wanna thank you all for tuning in and for indulging me on this new radio hobby that I soon will be uh, embarking into. So I'm looking forward to playing around with that, but also uh, doing all the other tech reviews that I do every single day here on the channel. That is gonna do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, Jim Tannis and Tom Albrecht, Hot Sauce and Video Games and Eric's Variety Channel, Brian Parker and Frank Goldman. Amda Brown and Matt Zagaya. And Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more.
And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv s.